Who would have thought that a heinous crime would be solved thanks to bugs? Hey everyone, I want to start off by welcoming all my new subscribers to the YouTube fam. My name is Ariana, or Ari, to the YouTube fam, and typically I cover true crime stories that have inspired the making of movies, but we are branching out just a bit on this channel because we're going to be covering some true crime cases that have not yet inspired a movie um, and today happens to be one of those cases that I find extremely interesting. So grab your wine and let's get into today's case. <gasps> Well, we're starting with a man named Vincent Brothers. Vincent Edward Brothers was a very intelligent man who graduated with his bachelor's degree from Norfolk State University and with his master's degree from California State University of Bakersfield. He was a really beloved vice principal of John C. Fremont Elementary School in Bakersfield, California. Vincent was married in January 2000 to Johnny Harper and they had already had their first child, Marquez, in 1998 and their second child, Lindsay, in 2000. But it's said that in September of 2001, they got their marriage annulled, possibly due to Vincent's infidelity, but after working things out between the two of them, they ended up remarrying in January of 2003, and they went on to have their third child, Marshall, that same year. The family was currently living in Bakersfield, California at the time. On Tuesday, July 8, 2003, Joani's sister stopped by her house to see her and the children, and what she found was just horrifying. She called 911 in which she frantically asked them to send the police because she said someone was dead and she would go on to say, quote, my sister, my best friend, she's dead. She's laying on the bed dead. When police arrived at the home of Joani and Vincent brothers, they found the bodies of Joani and all three of her children shot to death in Joani's bedroom. And she also found Joani's mother, Ernestine, shot two times in the face in the hallway. The police would later explain the timeline of the day of the killings as sometime between Sunday afternoon after they returned home from church. They had settled down to take their afternoon naps, which were customary, it was what they did every Sunday. And Joani and the children were in her bed while Ernestine, her mother, was in her room on the other side of the house. The police said that the killer would have entered the home and started in Joani's bedroom shooting her two times in the head. Then they shot Lindsay in the center of her back and there were also no signs of forced entry but Ernestine must have heard a noise of course at this time and she came into the hallway to investigate. She's said to have had a 38 revolver in her hand for protection but she never even got the chance to use it because she was shot two times in the face and dropped right there in the hallway outside of her bedroom door. The killer would have then returned back to Joani's bedroom and shot Marquez and then fired a final shot into the baby's back. Every shot fired was intended to inflict a fatal injury. According to the police, after reviewing the crime scene, they believed that the killer staged the place to look like a burglary, or at least tried to. After shooting everyone in the house, the killer then took a knife from a butcher block and went back to the bedroom where they ended up stabbing Joani multiple times in the back, which were inflicted after she was already dead. And as the FBI profiler, Mark Saforic, would later explain, he felt that Joani was the main target as she had sustained the most injuries, and he theorized the killer's behavior indicated significant anger towards her. After stabbing Joani, the killer gently laid her TV on the ground after unscrewing the connection on it. They then dumped Joani's purse on the laundry floor room floor, but they didn't take anything of value. They left everything behind, including money. And lastly, the killer went back and into the bedrooms and covered each of the bodies with blankets and pillows, which were brought in from other rooms in the house. Now you're probably wondering where was Joani's husband, Vincent Brothers, at this time? Well, on Wednesday, July 2nd, 2003, Vincent flew to Ohio to visit his mother, Margaret Brothers and his brother, Melvin. Once he got to Ohio, he rented a car and he mapped out his entire 
itinerary for the time he was going to be out there. And he was able to provide an alibi specifically for Sunday, as that was the day that the police believed the family had been killed. Vincent said he woke up at noon on Sunday and immediately called his family just to talk to them, but no one had answered, so he didn't think much of it. He went to the mall. He got lost on his way back from the mall to his brother's house. And he also said he crashed his car into a boy's bicycle where two people were able to testify that they saw a man crash into a boy's bike that weekend, but neither of them could identify the driver of that vehicle. He then said he came and went into his brother's house through a side door um, into the basement um, where he was staying at that time. And several members of Vincent's family said that they had heard him or saw signs he was there but that they didn't actually see him that weekend. On Tuesday, July 8th, Vincent headed to North Carolina from his brother Melvin's house in Ohio to visit his mother. Once he got to his mother's house, she was told, she was the one that told him what had happened to his family. Then the North Carolina police went to talk to Vincent where they said he was traumatized and crying inconsolably, which made them feel like he was an unlikely killer along with the fact that he was in Ohio and not Bakersfield, California. Three days later, Vincent finally returned to Los Angeles on July 11th and he did not attend his family's funeral service, but he did attend the funerals on July 16th. During this time, the police were earnestly trying to find the killer of this family and they began to come across quite a few alarming things, specifically alarming things about Vincent. For starters, they discovered that Vincent was actually not even living in the home with Joanne and her kids and her mother, but that he had moved out earlier that year in April. And not only that, but Joanne was also planning to divorce Vincent for the second time and she was planning to go after child support for their three children. They also discovered his dark history of violence against women. Vincent had been married four times prior to Joanne and police documents had actually revealed that he was once convicted of a misdemeanor spousal abuse on June 1st of 1988 and he was placed on probation and served six days in jail. He married again in January of 1992, and a year later, that wife filed for divorce, claiming her husband was, quote, violent and has threatened to kill me, according to the police. The newly disclosed 1996 incident occurred when Brothers was working as a vice principal at Emerson Middle School. According to district records, a female school employee said that when she visited his home, Brothers dragged her into his bedroom hit her and took pictures of her. She said she tried to call the police, but he yanked the phone away. She then ran out of the house and drove straight away. The woman whose identity was redacted in that report said that on another occasion, Vincent caressed her hips while she was working at the front counter of the school office. And according to the documents, the woman who then took a leave of absence, and she said that the harassment from Vincent, which included threatening phone calls, um, created an oppressive work environment for her. The records indicate that the district launched an investigation into Vincent's behavior, um, but he was, quote, advised very strongly that this could jeopardize his future career in education if any of these allegations were accurate. It said, quote, Mr. Brothers denied the allegations, and there was no record that Vincent was ever disciplined, and after that incident, Vincent was transferred to a different school, and with all of this coming to light, they then began to really hone in on Vincent and his alibi, and Vincent had already provided multiple receipts of places that he had been to during that time that his family was murdered. They looked closer at all of those receipts, and they had actually obtained video from the checkouts for the various store receipts, and they were surprised to see Melvin and not Vincent on the store's surveillance videos. 
Police brought Melvin, which was Vincent's brother, in and confronted him with the video evidence and Melvin told police that Vincent directed him to go to these various stores at certain times to purchase items and to sign his name. Melvin and his family told police that from fi Friday evening of July 4th to Monday evening of July 7th that they had not really seen Vincent. In fact, police could not find anyone who saw him. They really couldn't find any evidence linking Vincent to the murders either though. And the last thing they decided to do was take a closer look at the rental vehicle. So the police theory was that later on July 4th, Vincent traveled from Ohio back to Bakersfield where he then murdered his family on Sunday afternoon. He then drove back to Ohio totaling 4,500 miles round trip and then Vincent and his brother Melvin left Monday for North Carolina. They had this theory but then now they needed to prove it and the police had that Dodge Neon, the car he rented, examined and the University of California Davis's Bohart Museum of entomology was called in to assist. The car's radiator and air filters were examined and Dr. Lynn Kimsey, an expert in bug identification, identified insects that were consistent with ones only found west of the Rocky Mountains. He was able to identify every bug by species and the region and where they existed. Let's nerd out here for a second guys. So this bug entomologist found very specific bugs that would have only been found outside of Ohio and specifically found heading back towards Bakersfield, California. One of the bugs that she examined was a specific kind of grasshopper with red legs and this grasshopper is called a red shank grasshopper hopper and it's only found west of the Rockies and the second bug that was called an antlion which I think looks absolutely terrifying but this bug only flies around at night and only found in desert parts along with true bugs that are not very common but it's also only found around California. So I found this part of this case to be extremely interesting. The police finally felt that they now had enough evidence against Vincent to try him and arrest him for the mass family murder and in January of 2007, Vincent went on trial. The defense team and prosecution team of course went back and forth presenting their own evidences and witnesses to provide different arguments but ultimately, the facts proved that Vincent had multiple affairs at this time and leading up to the weeks prior to his family's murder. And being that his wife had been stabbed and then covered with blankets from, from around the house also showed that the killings were very personal. So on May 15th, 2007, Vincent Brothers was found guilty of five counts of first degree murder with special circumstances, making him eligible for the death penalty. And on September of 27th of 2007, Vincent Brothers was sentenced to death by lethal injection by Dern County Superior Court Judge Michael Bush and is currently housed in the same prison as Scott Peterson in San Quentin, California. So family and friends would say that Joani was the sweetest, most gentle person that you would ever meet. And also, Joani's mother, Ernestine, was an outspoken community activist. Her family would say that her main work was helping the defendants who were unjustly accused and that she was a fearless woman. Um, to speak into that just a tad, earlier in the case and while everything was unraveling, they did at the beginning suspect that Ernestine could have had enemies for the ones that she was trying to get justice for um, and it's said that that's why she had a gun in the first place was for protection because she felt like she could um, potentially be the target of somebody or her family could. So that was an interesting aspect to the case that of course the defense would try to use to say that this was not Vincent who killed his family but rather someone who was targeting Ernestine. But I don't know, the facts speak for themselves, but let me know what you guys think about that. Joani had been a gifted athlete and a star basketball player in her earlier years, but her real passion was ultimately helping children. And of course, when it came to the kids, the five-year-old, the two-year-old, and unfortunately the six-week-old, it's just so sad to know that they, of course, had their whole life ahead of them and for them to be tragically taken, 
along with their mother and their grandmother, it's, it's heartbreaking. And not only that, I mean, to have this done by their own father, it's, it's just an upsetting case. Thanks so much for joining me back here for another episode of Crime and Wine. Um, I'm so thankful for all my new subscribers. And if you would please continue to support me, share this video with a friend, press the like button, and comment down below your thoughts about today's case or maybe a case that you'd like me to cover, whether it's inspired the making of a movie or not. I would love to hear your thoughts on those cases. I'll see you back here next week for another episode of Crime and Wine.